Hello, I'm Annabel Gonzalez, non-resident senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. And I'm very pleased to welcome you and welcome you back to Tradewinds, our virtual event series where we discuss the future of global trade and investment in a changing landscape with leading policymakers and experts from across the world. Thanks to all of you for being here. I am very happy to inform you that we have now passed the mark of hosting participants from over 100 countries, 104 to be exact. So thank you very much for your participation. But of course, we still have some way to go to reach all 164 WTO members. So please keep coming. This is our third episode of Trade Wings in 2021. And we will discuss today, can the G20 reset global trade and investment cooperation? What's the plan? A topic of great importance if the largest 19 countries plus the European Union are going to join forces to fight the pandemic, sustain economic recovery, and build back better. Our conversation today will be led by two distinguished G20 veterans who know the summit process in and out and more. I have to warn you that I will only mention a few highlights of their fantastic careers Otherwise, we would need to extend trade wins for another 30 minutes. Let me first present Pier Carlo Paduan, who is chairman designate at the Board of Directors of UniCredit. Mr. Paduan has a rich and distinguished, distinguished trajectory in public service, having served as member of parliament and minister of economics and finance in Italy from 2014 to 2018. Also as deputy secretary general and chief economist of the OECD, economic advisor to several Italian prime ministers and executive director at the IMF. Additionally, he has been professor of economics at the Sapienza University in Rome, among others, and has published widely on economic issues. Professor Parwan has an extensive involvement in summit processes, including as the G20 finance deputy for the OECD. Today, he is the lead co-chair of the Task Force on Trade, Investment and Growth of the Think20, the T20, the ideas group that provides research-based policy recommendations to the G20 leaders. And I am honored to be one of his co-chairs. I am also delighted to welcome Jonathan Freed, who is senior advisor at Aldrich Stonebridge Group. Jonathan retired in August 2020 from his role as coordinator for international economic relations at Global Affairs Canada. And before that, from 2017 to early 2020, he served as the personal representative of Prime Minister Justin Trudeau to the G20. From 2012 to 2017, Jonathan was Canada's ambassador to the WTO. He played a key role in multilateral trade negotiations. He was the co-chair of the G20's Trade and Investment Working Group with China in 2015 and the friend of the chair for Germany in 2016. He formerly was Canada's ambassador to Japan, executive director at the IMF, and senior foreign policy advisor to the prime minister, among others. It is probably fair to say that Jonathan is the Canadian official with the most extensive involvement in G20 and G7 summits. With his first experience, dating back to the Ottawa Montebello Summit of 1981, fresh out of elementary school. So welcome to both of you, and thank you very much for being here at Tradewinds. I will turn to Piercarlo and Jonathan in a moment. For you in the audience, as usual, please get ready to submit your questions using the Q&A feature in the platform, and we will try to get to as many of them as possible. So under the presidency of uh, Italy in 2021, the G20 member countries had the opportunity to come together and craft a collective trade and investment response to fight the pandemic, support the recovery of the global economy and rebuild a better future. They also need to reboot the World Trade Organization to underpin renewed multilateral cooperation. The time and need for concerted action is clear. We know that COVID-19 has continued to spread in early 2021, with new variants increasing the level and speed of contagion. Plans to vaccinate as many people as rapidly as possible are being deployed, though vaccine nationalism risks prolonging the pandemic with dire consequences for many in poorer countries and for the world at large. 
The economic and social impacts of the virus and its containment measures are daunting. The global growth contraction for 2020 is estimated at minus 3.5%, with per capita income falling uh, in more than 90% of developing countries. Poverty rates have regressed to 2017 levels. Uh, global trade is projected to contract by 9.5% in 2020, while foreign direct investment could plunge by up to 40%. Recovery is expected in 2021, but it will be subdued and subject to uncertainty and downside risks. Domestic measures are critical, but they are not enough. The short-term response to the virus and the resumption of economic growth will require cooperation among the largest economies to scale back obstacles to trade and investment, to increase business certainty and leverage new opportunities. Building back better also needs concerted action. But none of this will happen automatically. Accounting for 80% of global output and 75% of exports and representing the largest advanced and developing countries across the world, the G20 is in a unique position to deepen collaboration across countries. As the Biden administration takes office in the United States, the timing is conducive to a reset in global trade cooperation. And with Dr. Ngozio Ponjo Iweala assuming the helm of the WTO, even more so. So let me now turn to you, uh, Jonathan, and start by asking you to please set the context for us. While the G20 has played a critical role in resuscitating the global financial crisis, the global financial system in 2008, the cohesion and effectiveness of the group has frayed since. We are now confronting a different, yet even more challenging global crisis. So in your view, in the current context, what can we expect from the G20? Annabelle, first of all, thank you uh, for inviting me to join. It's an honor to join you and uh, former Minister Padwen uh, as well. Uh, let me try and set the context by going back a, a step first. Recall that the G20 has its origins in a finance minister's process. And it, it started not in 2008, but back at the turn of the century, coming out of the Asian financial crisis, the Mexican peso crisis, the Russian financial crisis, and a collapse of a major hedge fund in the United States. Uh, Larry Summers, Paul Martin, uh, and Gordon Brown in particular said, uh, what we need is everybody around the same table. It has to be a round table, it has to be a table where people take co-ownership of the challenge and co-ownership of the response. It was meant to foster dialogue and common understanding. Uh, it was not purporting to be any kind of decision-making body as much as a, a caucus, not a global directory. So the consensus that uh, is to be reached at the G20 is one that is intended to be taken to the relevant uh, institutions. That spirit certainly carried forward in 2008 when in light of Lehman Brothers and the major Northern financial crisis, uh, first of all, a one-off emergency meeting of leaders uh, was held in a G20 format, followed quickly by a couple of others in London and in Pittsburgh Toronto and Seoul in rapid succession, uh, by which time G20 at leaders level became institutionalized. You highlighted the G20 response to the crisis in 2008. I would suggest that despite media criticism, because there was no single big bazooka this past year, uh, the G20 did succeed with pretty effective policy coordination across all of the economies in preventing an even worse uh, economic or health outcome uh, to the pandemic. Uh, just to give you one figure, the direct fiscal policy support, in other words, the additional spending and foregone revenues among the G20 members at the end of December uh, this past year was 7.2% of GDP, uh, over 10% by advanced economies and emerging markets, 3.5%. Uh, uh, 
all of which is to say the G20 at its origins and as its continuing focus has as a top continuing priority financial stability and improving prospects for growth. And it's within that context that trade fits. It's not a silo. It's not a separate agenda. It's a contributor and an enhancer to growth prospects. And thus, even in the era of finance ministers, you saw uh, G20 finance ministers and central bank deputies acknowledging and encouraging healthy trade and investment environments as a major uh, contributor to growth. It was really um, halfway through this century or in 2014 when Australia chaired that trade ministers came into their own. The Brisbane uh, uh, process uh, had a meeting of trade ministers and a decision was taken that trade ministers should meet regularly in a G20 uh, format. If you trace what's happened since 2014 to today, it's in the same spirit of finance ministers. Trade ministers have viewed the forum as an opportunity for a candid dialogue, for a round table to take some co-ownership and to caucus in effect, to build out a consensus rather than making final decisions. I'm gonna finish up this short introduction by noting even here, and again, notwithstanding the very modest publicity or credit given to Saudi Arabia uh, this past year, it was the G20 that formally said uh, and took to Geneva and the WTO that while emergency measures and some trade restrictions may be necessary in the name of public health, on medical equipment and the supplies, on food and so on, because they are permitted by WTO uh, rules on general exceptions. Any such measures should be proportionate, should be temporary, should be transparent and should be removed as, as soon as uh, possible. More generally, notwithstanding the continuing tensions between the US and China, between North and South, between those who uh, want improvements in the system and those who want uh, a more ambitious uh, agenda in the WTO, the G20 trade ministers and ultimately leaders have at least created a floor uh, of a consensus by acknowledging in Buenos Aires, in Osaka, and again under the so-called Riyadh track this past year that the WTO is important, has been a major contributor to growth and is in need of reform. And we commit, said the G20 leaders, to ensuring our officials work together to achieve those uh, necessary reform with a greater sense of urgency. So the table is reasonably well, well set uh, for a candid, open consensus building discussion this coming year. I'll finish up by saying, is it central? Is it going to decide things for capitals and for Geneva? No. Is the G20 as a forum going to be a contributor in a significant way to building consensus? Absolutely. Beginning at the officials level, there is a formal permanent trade and investment working group through regular meetings of trade ministers and onward up to leaders, complemented, going back to where I started, by finance ministers and governors continuing to emphasize the important role that trade and investment play to in, in uh, maintaining the conditions for stability and growth. Let me stop there. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Jonathan, for this uh, introduction. Uh, and we'll come back to some of the points that, uh, that you've made. Uh, Pier Carlo, let, let me now turn uh, to you. Uh, since uh, December last year, uh, Italy holds the presidency of the G20. Uh, as such, it has a special role in providing direction uh, and shaping the agenda for the high level uh, discussion uh, that uh, are to um, conclude with the leaders summit uh, in Rome on October 30 and 31st uh, this year. It is also, I think, very exciting times 
as this comes uh, at, at the moment when Mr. Uh, Mario Draghi will be leading uh, the country. So what are Italy's priorities in the areas of trade and investment for the G20? Well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me and sharing this uh, exciting opportunity of discussing also with uh, uh, Jonathan uh, issues that we both live through different perspectives, but with the uh, same approach, I guess. Before I come to your specific question, what Italy will do as G20 president, let me connect a little bit to what Jeffrey already put on the table, Jonathan has already put on the table, in terms of what the G20 has done in its, its history to support growth. Growth immediately became a central element of the G20 agenda. As you may all recall, the wording was sustainable, balanced, strong, and eventually inclusive growth were part of the key agenda items of the G20 throughout its activity. And in this perspective, trade, open trade and trade institutions were essential to providing sustainable growth and avoiding a uh, fall into protectionism. You may remember that when the financial crisis broke out 15 years ago, actually, uh, the, the, the most severe concern of policymakers was that we, that the planet would jump back into protectionism like the 1930s. This does not happen and I can say that it's very much the, to the merit of the G20 uh, for uh, uh, institutions to do that. So this is a very important element which should not be forgotten. We are now facing a much more severe crisis which we expect will not change, will, will not leave the world the same way the world was before the crisis. I'm thinking about permanent damage, which may be still slow to discover, for instance, in terms of global value chains, the, the impact of COVID and COVID response measures to save lives of people, unfortunately, will produce scars and will put the challenge of rebuilding back better very, very much on the upfront of the G20 agenda. So the point is what and how will uh, the G20 agenda change uh, if we take into account the consequences of the pandemic crisis? I think it will change much. So I think it's important that the G20 discuss among themselves and set on the table what would be the basic principles that would be behind any building back better effort that the G20 will have to leave and co leave in a hopefully coordinated way. Well, uh, the, let me come here now to the Italian presidency priorities. The Italian presidency has put three priorities on the table, people, planet and prosperity. This is a, of course, in a nutshell, a very strong message which translated into plain words means we cannot go back to business as usual. We need to go back to a more sustainable planet where social, environmental, and stability factors interact in a, growth, in a new growth model. And this is possible. This was even possible before the COVID crisis. Certainly in Europe, before the COVID crisis broke out, the newly elected president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, said, the new Europe cannot go on like, like it was before. It must tackle sustainability issues. It must tackle social inclusion issues. And the more so after the COVID crisis has hit us so severely. There is a risk of divergence as we exit the COVID crisis. And the debate in macroeconomic terms is already pointing, picking that up. I think that the G20 have a double challenge here to rebuild in a new basis a growth model which puts openness at its core. And I think, and I welcome the fact that the new Biden administration uh, has uh, reopened the dialogue with other continents, with Europe, but also with Asia, towards the establishment or reinforcement rather of trade lines and trade relationship across the globe on a new qualitative basis. So that even if we find that some of our the key global value chains have been disrupted. They can be rebuilt on a more sustainable basis. So from that point of view, I see a strong link between the G20 agenda and the European agenda, which is translating into 
into people, planet, and prosperity from a European perspective with a lot of funding to support it. This is good news. So what will Italy do in terms of the presidency given there is a new government? If, let me reassure you that Mr. Draghi in his uh, confident speech only a few hours back in the Senate has explicitly confirmed that this will be the approach of Italy in, as G20 president. And this is very encouraging because uh, it ties up so strongly and effectively to the global agenda where we need to face global challenges in a cooperative and multilateral way rather than individual basis. If we let individual uh, interest prevail, then we can get only a world of more divergence Less, po less prosperity, more poverty, and more, de more in, uh, and less inclusiveness. So the G20 is there to ensure that we, on a new basis, move on to the same line as we were before the COVID crisis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Padwan, uh, for your introductory uh, remarks. Uh, from this broad vision that uh, both uh, you and Jonathan have, uh, have brought to us uh, here at Tradewinds, let me now move uh, a little bit to maybe uh, uh, put some questions on the specifics. Um, so in the area of trade and investment in particular, um, could we expect that the G20 countries uh, would commit uh, to begin negotiations uh, on a trade and health initiative at the WTO. Uh, we know, uh, we have seen it uh, by the evidence that uh, uh, trade has a very important role in protecting the health and lives of people across the world, uh, and in particular in, uh, in, in uh, uh, helping governments cope with this pandemic and with future pandemics. So one idea that has been put out there is for a health and trade initiative. Do you think this is something that the WTO, that the G20 should uh, support? Uh, and um, will the decision by the EU to curb exports of vaccines impact the G20 discussions in this uh, area? And let me first uh, start with you, Professor Padwan, and then I will come to Jonathan on the matter. Thank you. Well, I think that the health and trade initiative is very timely. Unfortunately, throughout a very deadly crisis, we have learned how important health as a global as a global good, as a common public good is for all countries in the globe. And how to such a global threat, losing health or damaging health, we need a global response. Having said that, we need to be more proactive in finding uh, not only a global assessment, agree on global causes, but also agree on, on, on common responses. From that point of view, of course, we have seen, unfortunately, signs of uh, health nationalism, especially in terms of vaccine collection. Uh, this is something which should be discouraged. And I hope that over the next few months, as the amount of vaccines available grows so that there is no fear anywhere that some part of the population will be left out of the possibility of vaccination generates uh, aggressive, quote unquote, aggressive responses. I think that Europe has such a, global vision that will, will put together a proposal on the table for having a cooperative open solution to managing healthcare, uh, having in mind that once COVID-19 is defeated, we, 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 we will probably have to deal with new sources of health threats to new forms of pandemics. So we must be ready, not just for one emergency, but for a permanent response capacity. And I'm confident that Europe will play a key role in this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Jonathan, what is, what is your view on this, uh, on this idea of a health and trade initiative? Well, again, let me go back a step. Um, obviously, building back better is a shared desire, but the immediate needs will be paramount. In early discussions, I think uh, G20 finance uh, and leaders' representatives can be expected to discuss how much more stimulus how national budgets can be managed, including having enough uh, space for health. Uh, and in particular, to take a further look at the exposure of some developing countries uh, to indebtedness, 
A temporary reprieve was agreed last year through the Debt Sustainability Initiative. There is a proposal uh, uh, for making more permanent those arrangements. So helping developing and the poorer among us uh, and uh, not withdrawing stimulus too early are necessary preconditions. Um, on the need to ensure adequate supplies, equipment, vaccines. Uh, look, there is already a proposal on the table sponsored by the so-called Ottawa Group, a trade and a health initiative. Uh, the European Union is a uh, party to that and has given it strong endorsement. There is therefore already a foundation for further discussion in uh, Geneva. I mentioned earlier the notion that while you can't prohibit all uh, border restrictions, you can circumscribe uh, the conditions on which such restrictions are imposed. And although last spring we saw over 80 countries imposing one or another type of export restriction, those have come down uh, significantly. There will be uh, questions that will need to be sorted out. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, countries need to respond to their own citizens as a public health emergency. There is an India-South Africa proposal for a waiver of intellectual property uh, rules under TRIPS uh, uh, to facilitate more global production of generic uh, vaccines, which hasn't uh, had traction yet. So while I guess in, I would conclude this answer by saying, while various elements of the, uh, such a trade and health initiative have good prospects for uh, multilateral agreement, there will be some elements that will still remain subject to some uh, debate and some controversy. Again, not uh, to repeat too much, the G20 can provide in its forum a good airing in a non-negotiating setting for what those challenges are in order to better identify a path towards uh, broader consensus. So it will figure on the agenda. It will ultimately, however, need to be taken back to Geneva. Uh, final word to note is the new director general has quite publicly and repeatedly said uh, the WTO needs to address and facilitate the response to COVID. Given her background in Gavi and elsewhere, I'm sure she will be uh, a champion in trying to marshal member uh, economies uh, to that end. Thank you very much uh, uh, to both of you for your comments. A quick follow up with you, uh, Jonathan. We have a question uh, from a uh, former Mexican ambassador to the WTO, Fernando de Mateo, who says, shouldn't the G20 go back to the classical standstill rollback statement, including vaccines? Uh, the US and China would probably support it. Uh, what do you think about this? Um, uh, thank you, Fernando, my dear friend, colleague, and, and uh, mentor. Um, you know, one of the criticisms of the G20 and its members is that they don't walk the talk. And we saw through successive years, repeated pledge to a so-called standstill and rollback, uh, which was dishonored in practice by a number of countries. Is it most productive for officials and leaders to work on communique drafting to find that form of words? or is it more valuable to ensure that the actions taken, as uh, Pier Carlo said, uh, uh, respond to today's needs and realities of keeping uh, supply chains uh, going and facilitating the necessary trade and investment. I think reminding uh, participants of uh, that standing pledge is, is worth it. Does it become a brand new uh, focus? I don't think so. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. Let me take uh, one, um, one uh, uh, theme that uh, uh, Pier Carlo was uh, highlighting in his initial remarks. 
and which is this point that as major economies move forward uh, with ambitious goals and plans to green their uh, economies and build back better, there is an important role for the G20 members to, of course, lend support uh, to uh, these uh, measures. We have also seen recently in the WTO uh, the establishment of a group that is going to promote uh, structured discussions on trade and environmental sustainability. And we have a couple of questions from our audience uh, precisely on this point, which I would like to pose uh, first to you, Pier Carlo, and then, uh, and then come back to you, Jonathan. We have uh, Ricardo Melendez Ortiz, who basically says, with climate change a high priority for the new US administration, the EU and other G20, and the initiation of the implementation of the Paris Agreement in 2021, isn't it convenient to have the G20 promote joint meetings between the WTO and UNFCCC, as well as joint trade and climate change meetings at the G20 itself? Um, this would help avoid and constructively manage Im imminent tensions on the use of carbon border measures and other issues. So this is the first question, and I want to link it with uh, a question posed by Greg Smith on can the G20 support uh, in, in implementing uh, climate policies or technologies which are clean as the Paris Agreement is difficult to implement on its own as every nation has its own interpretation. So um, let me turn it over to you, uh, Carlo, and hear a little bit more on how could the G20 uh, support uh, greater uh, linkages between the trade and environment agendas. Well, thanks very much for those questions. I actually go back to the initials, uh, my initial experience in the G20, where I started by representing the OECD in a difficult environment institutionally. Let me say, I'm not, I'm raising this point because one of the positive side effects of having a rich G20 growing to manage global uh, global crisis or global situations was exactly to to build a network, although in formally network where countries would not just discuss together, but also ask the network of global institutions, the IMF, the World Bank, WTO, the OECD, to bring together their expertise and knowledge to come up with feasible solutions. So this has been a side effect of informal institution building at the global level, which has been very important. Now, exactly for that reason, I think the G20 has all the skills, views, and capabilities of bringing in a very delicate and, let, let's say it, controversial issue, which is trade and environment within a G20 policy environment where at least initial non-conflicting views can be put on the table to see how we can address these issues. Uh, from a European perspective, I think this is extremely important because Europe, as I said earlier on, has chosen to put uh, a sustainable and environmentally sustainable and socially sustainable growth as, as at the core of its buy back, build back better strategy and putting a lot of money behind this idea. So this, put, this is encouraging because it shows that there is possibility of acting towards the definition of a new growth model where we might, we, we might come to the conclusion uh, that having an environmentally sustainable growth model is not at the cost of having lower growth. We, what we are seeing today in the global marketplace is that, as everyone know, as, uh, can observe, it's financially profitable to have investment in green activities. And this is an encouraging point because it means that there is no obvious conflict between putting resources in environmental uh, issues and at the same time having a sustainable growth model. So how can we, this of course generates a demand for a, free, a regulatory frameworks which need to be harmonized. For instance, Europe is working on it. Ideally, we would have to see to what extent global regulatory frameworks can be set up to uh, facilitate uh, trade and environment relationships given that the markets are in demand of it. So again, I see the merit of institutions like the G20 as great facilitators of policy actions conducive to a better managed global system. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Pagon. Uh, 
Jonathan, do you think that the G20 can spur uh, uh, conversations on uh, trade and environment at the, uh, at the WTO? Um, in part, but I think it's a second order issue. For the last several years, 18 out of 19 countries have devoted most of their attention in the environment to ensuring there is no backtracking from Paris Accord commitments. The last couple of years, in effect, a show in the communique that it was 18 plus one with a different view. I think with COP26 in the offing uh, and with the Biden administration arriving, uh, the first order of business will be to ensure that G20 uh, leaders at center of government lend their full support uh, to moving forward under the power support. The second continuing agenda, also with trade implications though, is a just transition. Uh, for some time, uh, the G20 has not only had an environment working group, uh, but an energy working group. Uh, the G20 has been committed to a program for reducing and ultimately eliminating inefficient fossil fuel subsidies. It has, even in its environment discussions, promoted the use of clean technology and so on. I would understand that Italy, whether they bring together the energy people and the environment people, as has been done in the past or meeting in parallel, will continue that track. On environment and trade, uh, 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 a looming issue is indeed... Uh, carbon taxation or carbon exchanges uh, and cap and trade systems and how they might be married, including through border adjustment fees. Uh, frankly, I don't think it's yet ripe uh, for a discussion until and unless we see and understand further thinking from the European Union until the Biden administration fleshes out what uh, the president's uh, general commitment to uh, uh, a national system, including some border mechanism, uh, might be. And that, of course, is effectively a taxation issue as well, which takes you over to finance people needing to discuss at the same time. So again, remember that at leaders level, what you have is a truly interdisciplinary approach. If you have environment ministries, energy ministries, finance ministries, and trade ministries, it provides an opportunity for the centers of government to have a much better interministerial, interagency, interdisciplinary understanding of the complexities uh, of these issues. On the trade front, uh, in the spirit of building back better, I have every confidence that a number of participants will uh, argue for ensuring sustainability is an element of, uh, of future uh, supply chains. We see uh, increased attention to traceability as well alongside the financial sector demanding ESG accountability and rewarding investors. Uh, who, who buy into that uh, as well. But uh, does the G20 produce this year a package on trade and environment uh, ready-made for WTO adoption? Not quite. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. Uh, so we have been talking here about the G20 and the WTO, and uh, we have an important question uh, from Hilda al uh that uh, asked, is the G20 trying to replace the WTO or influence its agenda, knowing that WTO decisions are made by consensus? So you have been talking a little bit about this, uh, uh, Jonathan, about what is, the real, um, what, what is the real value of the G20? What is it that the G20 does? Um, so I, I like to ask you this question. And then there's a second question, a related question on, on the G20 and the WTO, uh, this time from Carlos Braga that asks, can the G20 help with the WTO reform? In your views, what would be the key measures to rekindle the relevance of the multilateral trading system and to renew the commitments of the G20 countries to WTO principles? So over to you first, uh, Jonathan, and then uh, Professor Padron, I'll come to you. Yeah, 
I think in no way, shape or form uh, are any of the G20 par participants purporting to usurp uh, what the WTO membership itself collectively is responsible for achieving and by way of consensus. It is a caucus among many. Uh, the BRICS also discuss WTO issues at their summits and uh, officials process, APEC, several other forums and caucuses all contribute to an airing and a clearing house uh, for ideas. Uh, thus, in that context, what G20 can do, first of all, at the officials level, because they are capital-based trade officials who go to the trade and investment working group, is gain a better connection between the thinking that they know about from Geneva on the ground and capital-based considerations, again, whether it's health, the well-being of uh, Indian farmers, uh, or what have you, so as to break out of the insularity of Geneva discussions to put it into a broader context. And as you move up to trade officials through ministers to leaders to try and instill more political will uh, to give direction to officials and to work with their respective neighborhoods and communities in Geneva to move the agenda forward. Um, while a clearinghouse is obviously uh, a desirable contributor, does it settle, as Carlos would love to see, uh, uh, an agenda for reform? Not quite. A good example is the reality of major countries uh, uh, pursuing industrial subsidies in particular sectors. So as early as uh, 2015, going into China's year in 2016, the G20 uh, created a global forum on excess steel capacity and Pier Carlo's uh, spirit had asked the OECD to serve as a secretary. The idea was uh, in disarmament terms that we would each ratchet down our subsidies without distorting pre-existing market shares so that nobody felt uh, undue pain while getting to a less costly level playing field. Uh, ultimately, however, after, after uh, three years of effort, uh, it failed, uh, and China withdrew uh, from this effort, although other members uh, continued to meet. So we're all aware of the major elements of the agenda. The EU, Japan, and the US in their trilateral setting have uh, highlighted uh, state capitalism, industrial subsidies, uh, and so on as major issues. We all know the appellate body itself by virtually unanimous agreement needs some form of reform, whether tweaking or more fundamental changes in the rules regarding standard of review uh, and so on. Does the G20 provide the right place to actually drill down into that detail? Not quite. Does it identify that these are the major blocks and thus the relevant officials, again, in Geneva and in capitals, in other caucuses and plurilateral groups, uh, whether it's the Ottawa group, the trilateral, uh, or what have you, need to uh, have more detailed discussion? Uh, absolutely. So the truth, I guess, is neither a do-nothing forum nor a pre-decision for the broad uh, G, uh, WTO membership, but uh, a significant and hopefully articulate contributor uh, to the path forward. Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. I think it's very clear. Uh, Professor Padwan, uh, what are your views on uh, whether the G20 can help with uh, WTO reform? And if so, what should be some uh, key areas? Well, Jonathan has already well described the difficulties of reaching consensus in a global environment, especially a global environment which is more and more complex and more issues are brought to the agenda on the table. However, let me inject a little bit of a uh, uh, different angle in, in the perspective, which is related to crisis. 
I'm not discovering anything new if I say that uh, as a response to crisis, institutional transformation accelerates. This was the case with the first financial crisis, uh, which uh, generated the, G, the G20 up, uh, uh, upgrading to leaders level and the putting on the table growth ambitions and financial stability ambitions, which we're not seeing before. Now we're facing an even more severe crisis, which is the pandemic crisis, which has down, deep down structural implications for the integrity of the world trade and investment system. So I fully share the view that Jonathan just put out on the table that one should not expect too much out of the G20 influence in, for instance, bringing forward a reform of WTO. But I would say that if leaders and citizens realize that the pandemic threat, not just COVID-19, but unfortunately possible future threats are there for us to stay, and we will need to upgrade the impact the, at the political level, at the institutional level that the G20 can have to uh, reinforce institutions, including the WTO. The more so as we move away from a situation in which with the past US administration, multilateralism seemed to be under attack of a more nationalistic approach by, from key countries. Now, this is another change in the situation which adds to the difficulty of the pandemic. If we want to face pandemics and global threats with a global response, and if we want to avoid the risk of going back to some form of nationalism, then the G20 will be useful uh, like in the past. And this could be a uh, spillover to specific institutional cases like the WTO. But I stand to be corrected. I hope not. I hope not, indeed, uh, because uh, arguably uh, the timing now is very different. Uh, the urgency now is greater. And of course, uh, I think this, both of you have said it in different ways, but this bringing in the political energy behind tackling some of the greatest challenges that we are confronting right now uh, would, be, would be very welcome, uh, I think. I also think the fact that there's new leadership at the WTO um, also provides another sense, you know, uh, can also contribute uh, to, I mean, aligning because I, it's clear that these are two different fora uh, and the way in which they operate is they operate at different levels, uh, but hopefully they will not be totally disconnected. Hopefully the political energy that can come from the G20 uh, could be translated into um, you know, more detailed initiatives at the WTO and at other uh, relevant uh, fora as well. Um, we have an interesting question uh, and, uh, oh, but before I, I go there, there's also, there's one uh, precise question on vaccines. And although we've already tackled health and, uh, and trade, I'd like to bring uh, this topic to you because uh, I, it is of the utmost relevance, of course, right now. Um, which is in this particular case uh, on, on vaccines, Giorgio Leali from Politico Europe uh, basically asked that the EU is opposing the intellectual property waiver uh, on coronavirus products, including vaccines, proposed at the WTO by South Africa and India and backed by others. And discussions in Geneva are not progressing. So he asked whether it is the role for the G20 uh, to discuss this or whether the presidency, in this case Italy, uh, will mediate uh, between these two camps. Is this something that you see happening at the G20 or, or more again, really something to be discussed at the WTO? Jonathan? Um, well, I think the answer is inherent in uh, the question. I think as recently uh, as the start of this month, there was an extensive discussion at the TRIPS Council in Geneva. There was uh, anything but consensus on moving forward with the India-South Africa proposal. And of course, it, it poses more fundamental questions about risk and reward in terms of the innovation required. Uh, to develop new technologies, new vaccines, uh, and uh, new treatment. Um, uh, and that requires, uh, you know, health and uh, trade and related uh, intellectual property expertise to be brought to the table. So I don't see it 
Uh, I think South Africa, India, and others may flag it as an element uh, where the G20 may well end up, however, is a more general full-throated support, or, uh, support for COVAX, for globally equitable access uh, to tests, to treatments, to vaccines. Uh, uh, and uh, this, this particular element uh, may not uh, figure in uh, that uh, result. The Geneva discussions inevitably uh, will continue. The precedent had been uh, the compulsory licensing waiver that was provided in times of public emergency in response to HIV AIDS. Uh, some view that as a bit cumbersome and it does uh, under the waiver uh, regime requires some compensation to the rights holder. In many people's view, it's still an adequate balance. So these kinds of things uh, need to be explored in, in greater detail. I would refer the questioner to a very comprehensive study uh, done in a first and a second edition jointly by WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization, together with the WHO and the WTO on the relationship between intellectual property, innovation, and uh, health. Uh, and it does not point in the direction of uh, the need for a uh, comprehensive uh, waiver. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Jonathan. Uh, do you want to say a word on, on, on this, Pier Carlo? Let me say that I fully share Jonathan's approach. Here we are at a negotiating level which goes beyond the impact that the G20 can have at the general level. And of course, he was right in mentioning that in addition to the WTO, the WHO should be involved uh, in, in, these, in these issues, but also in contributing a little bit better than in the past to providing uh, health security. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so one question we have not, uh, one topic we have not uh, tackled is that of digital trade. We've, we've dealt with uh, the pressing issues of health and trade. We mentioned uh, uh, climate, Jonathan referred to the issue of industrial subsidies. Uh, but we know that uh, uh, providing a governance framework for the digital economy is increasingly relevant. So what can we expect from the G20 in this uh, area? Uh, Pier Carlo, you wanna uh, start on this one? Well, this is an area where full of controversy. There are several aspects related to digital trade, including how to uh, introduce a digital tax, which is a, an, a, a policy instrument which has obvious implications for trade. Here, let me say that Europe's position is lagging behind with respect not so much to other national positions, but to other countries and other, com other countries' companies' advancement in exploiting trade and in, in, in the digital sphere. Certainly, uh, we need to provide a, a regulatory framework for digital trade, uh, so to provide a level playing field in market, but also uh, avoiding unfair competition coming from uh, big, big tech, the so-called big tech, for instance, big tech companies. At the same time, we see that policy attitude with respect to digital trade and digital uh, regulatory issues coming from China, which is a giant in these aspects, are also posing uh, possible negative consequences to establishing a global uh, agreed upon framework for digital, digital trade regulation. Of course, this is, goes beyond the current debate, but, but uh, eventually we will see an acceleration as digital trade becomes more encompassing. Let's also remind, remember that in the general building back better approach, digital is very much on the forefront. So we will face an increasing uh, role of market generated re regulatory uh, habits in, in some countries which can be exported. So it's a bottom line, it's a complex issue which needs to be addressed although I see it even more difficult than previous issues, including healthcare management. Mm -hmm. 
Mm, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, though I would like to hear what you think about this, uh, Jonathan. I'm going to change gears uh, and ask each one of you a different question uh, to conclude. And I'm going to take them from, uh, from our audience because uh, we have, two, I think, two great uh, questions. Uh, one, uh, Jonathan, uh, is from Stuart Harbison, who says that the G20 sometimes gives the impression that the WTO is broken as an institution and can be fixed by them in the same way as a mechanic fixes a car. Would it be more productive to concentrate on practical ways in which the G20 members um, could solve their contradictory trade policies, uh, which play out in the WTO? What do you think? Well, uh, thanks to Stuart, always a thought leader, uh, but I'm not sure I agree with the premise of uh, the question because in a G20 context, again, in that spirit of a non-negotiating forum where the dialogue is candid and sometimes uh, blunt, there is discussion uh, and not to mention during coffee breaks of individual countries' practices, uh, practical problems. Uh, the need uh, to roll up our sleeves and uh, get on with making things more harmonized in the same way that Pier Carlo calls for uh, uh, in, in other fields. And that's true in uh, digital as well. Here too, remember it's interdisciplinary. The digital taxation issue will engage finance ministers. The G20 for the last four years has had a digital ministerial track separate from the trade track and dealing not only with data flows and privacy, but a bid on taxation right through to principles that should govern the, de govern the deployment of artificial intelligence. Those are very real world, very practical problems that don't stand on broad principles of boxes to tick off on, on WTO uh, reform. So Stuart's point is well taken, but I think is answered in the modalities of how the G20 functions, especially under the kind of leadership we look forward to under Italy's uh, presidency. Remember, Mario Draghi was originally a finance Sherpa back as deputy minister of finance in, uh, when uh, the G20 was formed in the year 2000. So you have leadership right from the top. That's absolutely uh, right, uh, Jonathan. Thank you very much. Uh, Pier Carlo, I'd like to ask you the final question, uh, building on, a, on an interesting question that we got from Ben Digby at the beginning of the episode. And, and basically, how, you know, how would you like uh, the Italian presidency of the G20 to be remembered in, say, 10 years' time? Uh, 2008, 2009 were, of course, very relevant for the financial crisis, and we're now looking, with the benefit of hindsight, we're looking at, you know, how did the G20 perform at that time? What would you like, you know, uh, the world to remember uh, from the G20 under Italy's presidency in 2021? Well, I would like to, to be, Italy to be remembered as a, great, as a significant contributor to ending the pandemic and to laying the basis for a better healthcare global monitoring system uh, in the perspective that unfortunately we'll see more of this in the future. So a turning point in dealing with a fundamental public good, which is public health. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much, you. Uh, uh, Pier Carlo. And uh, let me, with this, uh, uh, wrap up this session uh, with, uh, again, my great appreciation uh, to you, Pier Carlo Paduan, and to you, Jonathan Free, uh, for a great conversation. Uh, I would also like, of course, to wish Italy well uh, as it uh, leads the presidency of the G20, because uh, that would be uh, good for all of us. Uh, I would like to thank all of my colleagues at uh, Peterson Institute who support uh, trade wins and make uh, it possible. Also, let me thank our audience and, uh, of course, ask you to continue participating, continue uh, coming. And please join us in our next episode of Trade Wins on Wednesday, March uh, 3. We will look into the impact of COVID-19 on global trading services and how to reignite trade services flows with Marion Jensen, the Director of Trade and Agriculture at the OECD, and Aditya Matu, the Chief Economist for East Asia and the World Bank. Until then, again, thank you all very much and see you soon. Goodbye.
Thank you, Annabelle. Bye-bye. Thank you.